life. I am listening to the last sessions. Made me so happy. I think the multitude of many layers Hans Ulrich brings to the table of VLD conversations. It's so inspiring and amazing. They are so coming out of a humanity from which we all can learn, which we have to learn. He is so, he, you know, of course he is always friendly, but he is insisting with his friendliness in a real outcome. He's doing, he's the best in reality production. Thank you, Hans Ulrich, at this place for all your friendship, for your love, for your amazing curiosity, for pushing us further and for make DLD so great as, as it is. Olaf Uhr, my good friend, thank you for coming back to DLD. Hans Ulrich will introduce you proper as Perini, the newbie at this session. Perini, we are proud to have you. You have an amazing CV, you have amazing um, uh, achievements, and I'm very happy that Olaf was suggested that you will be part of this DLD expedition. DLD is not a technology conference, not at all. It's not an art conference or an exhibition. It's not a politic conference. It's, it's a mixture, it's an intersection of interesting topics, and now you're part of it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so I'm so happy to uh, meet with you all, and thank Where you to all right for now? bringing me. Where, where are you right now? Uh, well, this is good morning from San Francisco. Oh, cool! So, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it amazing? We are in a synchronicity sphere. We are. You're in <laughs> Switzerland. Probably you're in Berlin. I'm in Munich. You're in San Francisco, and we share the same caring, caring for the worldness. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rennie and Ola, for it's such a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this year's DLD and uh, actually to launch something new today. It is a process. Um, it is a, a, a completely new project. Uh, we are very excited uh, to talk about that today. It's a collaborative project between the two of you and uh, many different practitioners. So it actually has a lot to do with what Alexander Kluge said tonight in the conversation with Mantia Diawara, that uh, what the world needs now, we need to find new ways how to bring science, art, and very important, also lift experience together. And that we can only address the big topics of the 21st century if we, if we do so. But before we talk about this very new project, I wanted to uh, actually ask you, Olaf, to tell us a little bit about your very beginnings at uh, DLD, because I remember it was one of the first DLDs with Steffi, and uh, you presented the very beginnings of the Little Sun projects. And I think it's interesting to revisit that project, that ever-growing project, particularly also during the centenary of Joseph Beuys, because of course in May this year, Joseph Beuys would have turned 100, and uh, your project is a great social sculpture for for our time and I wanted to ask you to tell us how it all began, how you presented it at DLD and how it has evolved ever since. Oh, thank you, Hans. And thank you for having me and, and also to Steffi for always being so generous and, and Pirini for joining up on, on my suggestion. I'm so happy that I'm not alone here uh, and having you in also um, equals out the gender balance a little bit at least. <laughs> I always wondered uh, when, she, when Steffi was praising you, when Steffi was praising you, Hans, uh, in the beginning, I have. I think this is my third or fourth time here with, with you indeed, Hans. And and I always wonder why get Hans is always invited, and and I always, uh, you know, I get invited here and there, until I realized that you are actually, uh, you know, involved. And then I realized, uh, you know, so that that's why. Um, having said that, I nine years ago, I think it was nine years ago, I presented Dillison for the first time and it was actually a MDF wood sort of a, a and we plugged in a few batteries on the bed. It was sort of a milled little model and it was kind of too way too early to show it, but we painted it with the hand and now it looks like this. It, it actually it does resemble it, solar panel, LED. And since then, at, at, since then, nine years ago, we have delivered more, well, well above a million, million 
in areas with no access to electricity. So it's going well, not as well as we obviously we thought it would be all of that, right? But we, we're doing very well. And, and now I'm here back uh, with you guys again. So exciting. And of course, we are here in the extreme present. And Olafur, you're having a show at the Bayero uh, Foundation in Basel, actually, in three weeks uh, with Sam Keller. And uh, you're going to liberate the museum, as you told me, from the chains of marketing. And you're also developing, during this COVID moment, actually, with a, a project where you're going to completely change the museum, going to change the way the museum work. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to happen in, in Basel, in Rien? Yeah, that's, of course, always the danger with talking to you, Hans. I tell you everything. So now, but, but since that one of the changes is that we don't have a press event, it actually started out with saying, well, COVID is here. And instead of you always referring to plan A, uh, what we would have done, and then plan B as the depressing what we have to do, we started turning the show around and said, okay, the plan B is the new plan A. And that's just how it's going to be for a while. And instead of being upset and sad about that, which is justifiable clear, clearly also, but we, why don't we try to make the show as if it is perfect in the current time? So what would a museum indeed look like and so on? So that meant a whole sequence of things, interestingly, actually started to happen. We reconsidered that whole thing with an opening. My God, that's also difficult. Too many people that can't do that, that the press event, no, can't do that. The whole idea of a museum maybe being inside. So I'm not going to say too much now, but obviously we had to now turn the inside to the outside, but even though the show actually is inside. And, and slowly, slowly we realized a lot of things that we considered for non-negotiable were actually quite relative. I mean, this is not so difficult to change. And we had this whole list of things that that maybe it's good to take them up for reconsiderations. And can you tell us how it's going to exactly work? Because as far as I understand, there is going to be a blur between the inside and the outside. There's going to be fresh air in the museum. But more than that, there is going to be water. There is going to be a garden, all kinds of things which usually we would not encounter. Yes, in, of course. But uh, so the idea is in a way to say something and not say too much. So I'm trying to strike that balance. I can say something which is just a rumor and I am not actually really sure, sure it's true. But uh, my exhibition is not going to close. It's not going to close. It's going to be open, but it's going to close at some point, I guess, unfortunately. But the, 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 it's open day and night. Is that why it's just open? So you can go at night, you can see that. It's very good for COVID. Then there's less people, right? And, and it's also beautiful at night. The museum is just like kind of, it's like magic. Why don't we go to a museum at nights more often? So it's like, oh my God, 50% more time just sitting there waiting, right? So all these, uh, so all these things, yes. Yeah, so obviously, as, as I, you know, the usual sort of stuff, flooding it, coloring like light and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but it's very nice. It's very wet, uh, you could say. I wonder whether that is a natural catastrophe or a cultural catastrophe. It's not really a catastrophe anyway. It's very beautiful, I hope. Thank you so much, Olafur. And actually, I wanted to ask Pirene to tell us about your many different projects you're working on at the moment. Olafur has been telling us about the Bayla Foundation. Your work has many dimensions. It's almost like in superstring theory. There is poetry, <laughs> but there is also your work of actually producing reality. Um, yes, and actually Oliver asked me just before we came uh, in back backstage, he said I should also mention uh, that I'm, I study the martial arts, um, but I think they're all very connected. They're very much, it's, I think it's been a life, um, and I didn't realize this at the time when I set out on this life, but a life thinking about attention and the body, how to be truly more embodied within oneself and how to change different senses of attention. Obviously, as a martial artist, you think very, you experience this, how to kind of almost freeze time as you're um, experiencing these situations. But at the, in the same way, it's brought me into science. I pursued looking at neuroscience and cognitive science at Oxford. And this is very much, I was fascinated by the brain and human beings, how we how we respond to the world around us. Um, and, and of course, I've always loved, loved art and spaces and always thinking about the space and bodies. So it was almost inevitable that I would be drawn uh, into Olafur's amazing, uh, you know, as a satellite to his amazing kind of gravitational pull. So I'm so thrilled to have met him, I think, uh, Olafur, maybe 10 years ago now. So. Um, it's been really um, wonderful to have a chance to think, not to be siloed into these sections of science versus art. I've never known what I am. Well, I mean, I'm many things and I don't fit into 
a simple uh, marketing typology. Um, and so, yes, I do many things. And I have to say, I've just recently, a new, a new thing I can announce is, well, two things. One is that um, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm working on a, on a book right now, uh, which is about social media and how it's changing our brains um, and changing society. So how our brains, how we're being rewired from the inside as we interact with um, these kind of attention capture platforms and what's happening to our children, what's happening to our future and to our democracy. So it's, um, it's a, I think it's going to be quite an interesting book, uh, which will have relevance to a lot of people. But the new news, the even more news, fresh, fresh as of a few hours, um, is um, that I've been asked to come into Oxford University, um, to University College, the oldest college, and to uh, be a visiting poet and creativity catalyst. So basically to rethink how we can change attention and to, it's, uh, it, to bring together the arts and sciences in many different new ways, to refocus people's attention, to think outside boxes. So anyway, those are just a couple of the projects that I'm working on. And, and of course, I... Uh, and I feel so privileged to also work with the Center of Humane Technology, where I help assess research and evaluate data on social media. Thank you so much, and congratulations on this new on this new apartment. Um, now, one thing I think would be exciting is that we now could talk about this new project. Olafur didn't tell me much. He said it's in big part still a secret, but he said we can actually announce it at DLD for the first time. Um, it's not a smartphone, but it's a dumb phone. And um, actually, it made me think also of a, of a conference maybe six, seven years ago at DLD where we worked on the solar airplane with solar inventors. Vika was involved, Otterson was involved, you were involved. Uh, but today we are not going to talk about solar airplanes, but we're going to talk about this new device about the dumb phone. What is a dumb phone and how did this uh, project begin? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I started talking to my friend who first brought the notion uh, to my attention. Uh, a dumb phone is Jonathan Safran Foer, the author, and uh, and um, he seemed to be very interested in it. And he he might or might not be reading about it. He's certainly very thorough. So we talked and several times, and uh, and I started looking into it myself. And I was and and I was I was watching the film uh, The Social Dilemma, and I remember that actually Pirini was on the scientific team working for the film you might have seen it the social dilemma so i called Purina and said this thing about why don't we see so uh, what 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 if what if right and Purina, of course so quantum leaped it into the future and i was struggling to catch up but the point i think is that it's actually not a dumb phone that takes away from what we have today it is a dumb phone that makes what we have today better and it's very important to sort of not say, oh, these are the guys with the dumb phone. Oh, my God. But it's, it's, it's actually a qualitative upgrade, you could say. And what it is, uh, uh, who it is a smart dumb phone for, a hyper smartphone, a much smarter phone, is, of course, it is now uh, providing uh, the best possible service to the owner and the user of the phone. Right. So unlike the current phone sort of concept and the way the, the whole economical setup works is evidently made so that it provides for the best uh, possible results for the people who are providing apps and uh, content and producing the phone and so on. So the notion essentially was born out of this idea. But what if we say that one of the great challenges today is to rehumanize, to rehumanize the planet? And what if we said, okay, this is a phone that is capable of upgrading what it means to be a human. And that's kind of the beginning of it. Pirini, what about your perspective on this new on this new invention? Oh, I think it's, um, you know, I think what's sort of wonderful working with Olaf is that I feel like he's constantly at the cutting edge of almost sometimes, not just the cutting edge, but sometimes even predicting where neuroscience is going to take us. So I remember when you, Olaf, when you, he did the riverbed uh, installation at Louisiana Mod, uh, uh, Museum, there, there was so much, um, so much in that installation was emphasizing this idea of being lost and the idea that the possibility of being lost anticipating a generation to come here we are seven years later where most people don't know what it is to be lost you gave us that experience because we always have these phones that give us maps and tell us precisely where we are give us certainty and you anticipated all of this i think by kind of showing us here are spaces where we can be uncertain where there can be ambiguity and you really and i think this is something that uh, of course happens in 
other art galleries and other art spaces, and this is what the arts contribute to us, but you really, I think, brought it forward to our attention, if I can say that. Um, so I think part of, I think it's really a natural extension of the work you've done in the past, where it provides a, a way for the brain to um, basically not be going into, instead of being hyper disrupted, these spaces that you create, all of a, allow us to be in um, a state which scientists have now identified. Um, these are quiet states of contemplation where it triggers a different neural network um, connected around the default mode network, which basically we really very much need um, in order to then, when we engage with the world in mm -hmm. complex attention, mm -hmm. uh, attention, we can then do it because our brains have had a chance to be mm -hmm. in this more um, dreamlike space that galleries and arts provide us. So if you can do that with a gallery, why can't we do this with a phone as well? How can the phone do that? Rather than the phone being right now a, an, an attention capture system because it's being utilized. Um, you know, this phone gets smarter and smarter and our brains <laughs> become diminished by the phone, you know? Um, so there should be a way that we can think about how the gallery space, museums, art, reading a book, how these things um, create, lay, help us lay down very complex, elaborate neural networks. How can a, how can technology help us do this as well, rather than subtracting from us, and rather than, I mean, you know, rather than pushing us down channels of very stereotyped behavior, very minimalist thinking, very distracted thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's fascinating. So it's basically, you know, I was friends with the late Francisco Varela, and he always said that we should come up with. Um, a great neuroscientist, and he he always said that we should come up with um, portable laboratories. And of course, there is a, a long history in art, Duchamp, for example, of portable museums. So is it a portable lab a la Varela, or is it a portable museum? I think that, um, <clears throat> well, clearly, uh, this notion of mobility, as you are carrying around with you a device, but if you come to this this notion of what it what does it mean to be present, right? What does it mean to be present to another person? What does it mean to take in information and the degree of concentration needed, the minimal degree of concentration needed to actually take in and store it in short-term memory, long-term memory, bigger embodied memory or somatic memory or muscle memory. So what, how do we then you know handle this little two-dimensional piece of information that you're you're getting? I am involved very much so with a, uh, an app called Acute Art, which started as VR and it's then AR. It's you know mixed reality, and I'm I'm quite involved with exploring the nature of the interface. To what extent are we disembodied and out out locked out of even having a body, like literally disembodied, or to what extent are we actually brought to consider the the, the role of our hands on a computer screen like now, right? So apparently, it's a study suggests that I'm 15% more convincing if I have my hands in the shot, you know, if I if I use them, and and that is uh, very good if you're a student who goes to exam. If you have a digital exam now through COVID, you should you should sort of. Um, and, and there's so much interesting science, and, and as, as Pirini just sort of uh, laid out, we, we, we are kind of moving into the knowledge already available. I'm just, I have three amazing women here, the Shoshana Suboff, who did the surveillance, surveillance capitalist, capitalism and the data extraction. Well, like, that was a huge success two years ago, the, bo, the book, and Abeba Berhane on digital biases. I mean, digital biases, like incredible. What I mean, there's so much information. And of course, it turns out that the biases in the phone is as big as the biases in our society. Not a big surprise, though. Caroline Criero Perez did on gender biases and design. And uh, so, so the digital biases, the, the kind of gender biases, and all the things that one could actually somehow say, well, if we can't concentrate, we're full of biases, we're disconnected from our own bodies, is actually worth to consider, doesn't this sort of add up to the argument for the process of rehumanizing the presence and how to sort of convey that presence into even involving climate, intersocial behavior, health, poverty, there, there's just so much interhuman uh, material that or interhuman and more than human plants and species and all of that, right? So so I think there's a there's a great point in and I, and I think it's becoming very mainstream also it's a great point of saying, well, I'm going to invest a little bit in becoming more human. Yeah, yeah. And I would say Olafur mentioned the planetary perspective. And 
I very much, very much think that this project is part of not just, you know, that the species as a whole. If you look at any biological system, the ones that do best are the ones who are most adaptable. And if we're going to face a future, and UNESCO talks about this now as an initiative, UNESCO has the initiative of futures literacy, which I'm sure you're aware of, of how do we make our species more resilient for a planet and an environment that is rapidly changing? We cannot just be, we don't have any copy and paste solutions anymore. So we need to be highly flexible in our approach. And that's not going to be happening if, we're, if we are with technology that is driving us down into becoming more and more conformist, more and more uh, conforming to marketing types, uh, more and more reactive to anger and fake news, uh, which immediately shuts down the brain, by the way, when you're exposed to anger and fake news, there's a whole bunch of neurochemicals that get released that mean you, you really restrict how you understand information. So instead of that, we need brains that are opening up, that are able to sit with uncertainty, ambiguity, and, and to be able to change rapidly and to be much more responsive than our technologies currently, you know, are current, uh, certain forms of technology, let's say, are driving us because they have a, in a different, in the wrong direction, because of, because they're, they're predicated on, you know, an attention economy, an attention extraction economy. We need to be doing the opposite. We need to be boosting an uncertainty economy, let's say, or an ambiguity economy. I like that. Right. I like that. Yeah, maybe, that's super fascinating. Maybe, maybe it should be called the ambiguous phone. Just like who's calling? Yes. <laughs> I like that. No, and we and obviously we have a hundred ideas already. Like if a child walks into the room, it turns off, or only the child's mother can call. Or you know, there's like all these small things in the whole of the day. Right? It's a little bit like if anybody ever thought about the fact that when you watch a Netflix or some episode, uh, um, uh, all of them, Apple, everyone, right? It you don't have to turn it off before the next one comes. So the so the, the active one is to stop the flow, it's not to start. So there is a question of where is the authority here? Where is it the user? Is it me? Or am I the pacifier? Am I like am I like just like don't have to do anything? And the authority is obviously and in the user interface uh, discussion, I think there is an interesting debate right now, which kind of comes out of uh, the, the mandate of the user, right? And, and it's interesting because we have the blockchain and we have that whole sort of scene, which is very much operating out of the idea that the user is the one who has the authority. And that suddenly it becomes much clearer to explore, well, wow, there's a lot of st stuff, lots of plans, so lots of user interface that's built up around how to best pacify because then they don't do all kinds of stuff and they go, oh, there's my hands, all the stuff on their computers. Now, one thing, this is all super fascinating. One thing which I wondered is, because of course these, you know, existing devices are mostly there to connect us. And the other day I spoke to Paul Chan and he said, actually, we need devices to de-link us. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the dumb phone helping us to de-link. And I know we are out of time, so it will yeah. be my last question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two minutes. De-linking, a device to de-link rather than to link. Pirin, you take that. Thanks, Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to kind of look at these definitions around like when we say do we need connection versus belonging, right? And I think that, um, you know, when you look at the data around some of the, uh, Facebook, for example, it, you know, people on average, uh, the average user is there 50 minutes um, a day using it. It's about, uh, you know, so 350 minutes a week, nearly six hours a week. And you think about how you can, you actually don't need that to be connected. So when you, when you actually put a price on it, people find they actually only want to be on Facebook or other social media platforms once or twice a week. So that sense of you can still be connected perhaps, but not as much as your brain is being dragged in an, adapt, in an addictive manner into compulsively staying. So maybe we should think about like what type of connection, the depth of the connection, right? It's not the connection per se is bad perhaps, but the level in which this apparent illusion of connection is happening, uh, which is actually destructive at, because it's a zero sum game, because it means that we're spending three, nearly six hours a week less with our own social interactions. Um, teenagers now spend twice as much time looking at a device than they do with their families every single day. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a, an aspect of trying to think about this problem, but read my book. <laughs> I can tell you about the brain mechanisms. You thank have you to introduce. So, so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, Pirini, you, you have to um, uh, introduce your book soon. 
a DLD. I mean, are very curious. Oh, next year. I, I have, <laughs> okay. yeah, next year, okay. I count on this. I have an idea. I have an idea. You, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm more convincing than I do so, I learned. <laughs> um, we should much more worship the off button. We have no, mm -hmm. we've forgot to push the off button. <laughs> we should f learn to, to use it. And I love two things. I love the idea of an ambiguity phone, not a dumb phone, ambiguity phone. This is interesting. This makes it, you know, this makes it um, some uh, curious. What is ambiguity yes. to, to do with a phone? I think it makes sense. I, th I totally agree that we should also not only push the off button much more, we have to learn to deal with uncertainty. Uncertainty mm -hmm. defines our life, if we want right. to or if we not, not want to. I think it's really um, important. And then a very simple, maybe a too simple housewife advice. I, I encourage you and the audience to think about the simple idea what do I really want? What is it what I want? Not what in terms of starters. Or, what is it what defines me and what do I want? What does that have to do with a housewife? Uh, <laughs> I ask myself that all the time. Good. That's wonderful. That's one. I sometimes I'm it's too simple sometimes to say it, to ask this, but it's it has a deeper meaning in it. So the housewife in me ask you all of this. Thank you. Thank you for this great panel. I could yeah, listen to you thank all you so much. for hours, for hours. Thank you, Hans. Hopefully, hopefully, Hans hopefully, again, thank you. thank you. Rini, thank you. Steffi. Thank you so much. Big and song hopefully this is chapter, chapter one yeah. of many chapters to follow. And I would very much love if we can continue this in April also with Charles and Safran for that we, you know, we're going to expand. Yeah. Yeah. And what I also want to add as the housewife, I want to add, I'm totally convinced that the last 20 years defining the internet, the digitalization era is going to change. We have, we are in, in, in the, in the beginning of a new world, new, new world. And you are the ones, you are the ones who has, have to come and align in this new world with our journey together. We are on a mountain hike. And when we are at the top, the world is different. So I'm looking forward to this mountain hike. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs>